it's a bittersweet morning for us. We're going to be concluding our study in the book of Acts, which we've been on for quite a bit, not that long. It's the fastest I've ever gone through Acts. Um, but I've enjoyed it. I hope you have as well. Uh, studying about how God is at work actively in the life of his people. A lot of say this is, a lot of people wrap this up and say that this is the Acts of the Apostles, the study of uh, the disciples at work um, in the church. And I think that we've tried to look at this in a more broad brush of the study of how God is at work in the life of his people, how God is at work in the life of his church, not necessarily or not limited to how the works of the disciples, but more uh, directly how, the, how God is working through the disciples, how God is working through the church, how God is still working through his church and through his people, how he is not wasting time or relationship or how he is not limiting anything, but how he is actively involved in every aspect of creation and salvation and getting to know his people intimately. When we left off last Sunday, Paul was challenging King Agrippa and Festus and the gospel with a very bold presentation of the gospel and a call to repentance and action. Paul's destination was already set. He had already appealed to Caesar and it was only a matter of time. It was only for show and for a matter of writing charges that Festus entertained an audience with Paul and Agrippa. In chapter 27, Paul set sail. If we were to look briefly at chapter 27, Paul set sail for Italy with other prisoners under a centurion named Julius. The journey was anything but normal. They were traveling at the wrong time of year. Late fall, early winter, and the seas were turning against them. Paul knew that the, this journey was unsafe. We see that in verse 10 of chapter 27, if you want to look there briefly, Paul even speaks out, saying that he knows that this voyage is going to come at a great cost. This is a perilous trip. It's not going to end well. But of course, no one listens to a prisoner. As the storm gets worse, the crew begins throwing tackle and supplies overboard in verse 19. And in verse 20, if you look there, many had lost hope, even thinking that there's no way that they're going to live through this. Paul, on the other hand, knew that he was going to Rome. Right? We saw in Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 15, that the message of the gospel is going to go to Rome. He is headed that direction. He knows that that's the ultimate goal. In verse 22, Paul tells of an angel that appeared to him and reassured him that he should not be afraid. The angel says, you must, you must stand before Caesar and all who sell with you will also live. After maintaining the chaos and keeping the crew of the ship from killing the prisoners and abandoning the ship too soon, they finally run ashore near the island of Malta. Now, notice this. When you're looking at chapter 27, you might wonder, why is the immediate retort to kill the prisoners? Well, time and time again in the book of Acts, we see that where God ordains a jailbreak for the disciples... And the response when a jailbreak happens is that the, the, the jailers or those who are keeping watch over their prisoners are to receive the punishment that was due for the prisoners. So those who are keeping watch over the prisoners on the ship, response is if we're going to have to abandon ship here, if we're going to have to get in the, in the, the dinghies here, if we're going to have to get on the small life rescue boats here, Perhaps we can't take all the prisoners with us. And if we do, what if they run away? What if they escape? We can't risk our own lives here because if they escape, our lives are on the line here. So their response, their retort here is, we're going to kill all of the prisoners so that our lives might be saved. Because if the prisoners are dead, they could not have escaped. Well, Paul says, no, no one is going to die. No one is going to die on this journey if we stick together, if we endure, if we wait on the ship to the appropriate time. No one is going to die. Everyone is able to escape in chapter 21. Some by swimming, some by floating on boards. But at the end, it was just as the angel had reported to Paul. All would be safe. Right? Everyone survives. Now what's interesting is, is the time on Malta proved rather interesting for Paul as well. 
We talked about this last week. If there's ever a moment in life where you're counseling someone who believes they're following the will of God and door after door after door keeps closing, you start telling the person, maybe you're not following after God, but maybe you're following after your own choice or your own will. Maybe you need to re-examine your relationship with God. Maybe you have a bad connection. Maybe you need to charge your cell phone. Maybe you need to just reconnect. But what Paul sees time and time after again here, and what we're going to see here when he's in his time on Malta, is that things aren't going to end up very well in his time on Malta. While everyone is drying off and they start to build a fire, Paul is gathering up firewood here. And at the beginning of chapter 28, a snake, a snake is hiding in the wood and latches on to the hand of Paul. Immediately, the natives begin to think right? They begin to think, here a murderer is getting what he deserves. Sure, he might have escaped the shipwreck. Sure, he might have been able to get to shore. But when he got, starts gathering up firewood, a snake grabs his hand. So he's, karma has caught him, right? Think about this for a second. Eventually, if you keep doing enough wrong, you're going to get what you deserve, right? So here the natives are thinking, He's finally gotten what is, what is his due. The snake has bit him. The, the natives begin to think he is going to die, but then he doesn't die as they thought he would. So Paul goes from being punished by God, by some random God, to becoming a God in just a matter of moments. Talk about confusion. You go from being punished by a God to becoming a God. What do we do now? The time of Malta was not a time that was lost. The snake bite, the encounter of the seas, none was lost. However foolish and reckless the action of the centurions and the owner of the boat on the time at the sea, the time in Malta was not wasted. They should have never gone out to sea. They should have never gone on this journey. Here is a man in Malta, the father of the governor who is sick, whom Paul has the opportunity to pray for and to see healed. Here are people who hear the gospel and many believe. The moments are not wasted. Isn't this the message of the book of Acts? God doesn't waste time. God is actively involved in the life of his people. While God is sovereign and we are responsible for our actions, The sovereignty of God doesn't denounce the responsibility of our actions. We begin to catch a glimpse of the context of what is written by Paul in Romans chapter 8, verses 27 and 28. Remember these famous verses of ours that we like to quote in bad days? When the barista burns our latte, you know what I'm saying? Or when the the cop pulls us over for speeding, we say, God works all things together for our good, right? No. No. That's not the proper context for that. Romans 8, 27 and 28. Let's just refresh our memory here. Paul writes, think of this in the context of what's happening in Malta and Acts 27 and 28. Paul writes in Romans 8, 27 and 28, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to the promises of God. Amen? Amen. This isn't just some fortune cookie verse to use on the day when we think things aren't going the way we wanted them to, to get out of the speeding ticket, or when we get mad at our neighbor for planting ugly flowers. No. This isn't the verse that we think of when we think we're having a bad day or when our boss is not treating us the way we want to or when people are being mean to us. No, this is a verse that we remember of Paul being in Malta or Paul being stoned and left for dead or Paul enduring hardship after hardship, Paul being chained to Roman centurion after Roman centurion, Paul reminding us to live according to the purpose and the direction of God. Not Paul just saying, hey, when you're going about your daily life completely devoid of God and then something doesn't go your way, you can cite God as a reason for things going to turn out your way. He says, no, Paul is saying that when you're living according to the plans and the purposes of God, when you're loving God, when you're understanding how God is working in your life, when the gospel is forefront in your life, you can rest assured that things are going to work out for the purposes of God. Not just when you're going down the highway going 80 miles an hour and you get pulled over because the speed limit is 75. That has nothing to do with the equation. 
Even though we all do it, we're like, well, you know, this has got to work out good. You know, this, no, it doesn't. We are responsible for our actions. God is sovereign. We are responsible. When we do stupid things, God says, you're doing something stupid. Get it together and love me right. We don't have to say amen because we disagree. We don't like to do stupid things. This is not the right context, but this is hope. For that when we love God, when we understand the purposes and plans for God, of God, when we live according to what God is calling us to live to, we can say yes and amen because God is a promise keeping God. He is active in our lives. He doesn't just put us off to the side and say, well, they'll figure it out. He doesn't wind the clock as we talked about in Acts 2, 3, 4, and 6. He doesn't just wind the clock and say, maybe they'll end up in the right place eventually. No, he's actively involved. He's not a God who in Luke 2, when all the Hebrew children were being slaughtered, he said, well, that's just something that had to happen. It'll work out for the best. No, he's a, he's a God who when the Hebrew children were being slaughtered, he is looking forward and saying, and King Agrippa is going to know the prophets. He's going to know what's happened. So that when Paul is presenting the gospel in Acts chapter 26 and Acts chapter 27, he is going to present this as, don't you believe? And while all of us are sitting back saying, this is such a terrible thing. Yes, it's a terrible thing. But it serves the purpose of the gospel being made known to the nations. And we can see Matthew 24, 14, that all peoples and all nations are going to know. And there's not a life or a moment wasted in the kingdom of heaven. And all the bad things that happened to Paul served a greater purpose. After three months of being in Malta, they head back out to sea. Now, that was a sermon on itself, and that was a free one. Now we're getting back to 27 and 28. Three months of being in Malta, they head back out to the seas for Rome once again on another ship. We cannot forget that this is a very unconventional way for Paul to get to Rome. The journey continues, a journey of triumph for a prisoner who has an escort that can either be seen as a hindering to the spread of the gospel or one as of heavenly proportions that are paving the way for God's glory to be proclaimed to all peoples and all nations, more than anyone could have ever thought possible. And in Acts chapter 28, we're going to be focusing specifically this morning on verses 11 through 30. And it says, after three months... Paul and Luke are giving us this account. He says, We set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with twin gods as a figurehead, putting in at Syracuse. We stayed there for three days. And from there we made a circuit and arrived at Rehegum. And after one day, a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we came to Petulia. And there we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when he came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Let's stop here for a minute. It had to be of some encouragement at this moment for Paul to see brothers and sisters waiting for him. Notice this, they're waiting for him at the forum outside of the city of Rome, almost 43 miles outside of Rome. Then he got another 10 miles closer on his journey to this place that he had been traveling for so many years there. There waited more brothers who had gathered to encourage him and to walk with him into the city. We see the effect that it has on Paul. Paul, who is a missionary who had taken this journey, he had walked thousands of miles in this journey, and yet his final task had taken so long he had been beaten. He had been in prison. He had been questioned over and over again only to be shipwrecked, to be bitten by a snake. Finally, Paul was seeing that what God was leading him to. God was bringing him into Rome and the word had spread and God brought people to minister to him. God brought people to encourage him on this last leg of the journey. Imagine this for a moment. Let's just stop here for just a moment. Imagine this. Paul, who has had false accounts of his life, spread throughout all of his people. Remember, Paul was a Jew of Jews. 
Paul would have ended up being perhaps a chief priest. He was a Pharisee. He grew up knowing the law, memorized the law. He grew up in the temple. And who was it that turned against him? Those in the temple. Who was it that sought to have him ambushed and killed? It was the Jews. His friends had turned against him. Those whom he grew up caring deeply about had turned against him. Imagine the mental turmoil that he was going through. His friends had turned on him. But we've read for the last three and four weeks, this is exactly what Jesus had said would happen. Friend will turn against friend, mother and father and brother against you, and they will turn you over to be killed. And while we can read this, and while we can, while we can be encouraged by Jesus' words, and knowing that, yes, this is faithfulness, but the anguish that comes with this, we're humans here, right? Here he's on this last leg of this missionary journey and he's walking into Rome and here these people come out to encourage him, to show him love. This is encouragement. This is love. Now as he heads into Rome, our response might be, this is going to be the ultimate, the penultimate moment of Paul's preaching ministry. This is the time when, when hundreds of thousands would gather around to hear the message of the gospel. We must recognize that Paul has his own personal bodyguard. Not quite, it's a centurion. Paul is still a prisoner of Caesar and, is, and this soldier is attached to his arm or his wrist. While he does get to live in a house that is provided for him or he has to pay for, his freedom is limited and his ministry is going to take on a different shape than we have seen previously. He's not going to be standing in the Colosseum preaching to thousands of people. He's going to have to wait for people to come to him. And in verse 17, we see this picture start to take shape. And after three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they wished to set me to liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appear to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I, I asked to see you and to speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel... Because, notice this, because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this, wearing this chain. And they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you. And none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you your views for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Paul wasted here no time in calling the leaders of the Jews together with him. He had a clear vision. Notice this. He had a clear vision of his purpose. And he knew that he had been brought here to share the gospel in Rome. And he proceeds to doing that with calling the leaders of the Jews to address them with the issue that got him sent here. He proceeds to present his case to the Jews. The fact that he has done nothing wrong against our people, against our their customs are our customs, uh, the customs of, what does he say here? Our fathers. He says, this is our people. I've done nothing against the customs of our fathers, but yet the Jews would have not allow for his freedom. Notice here he says, that is for the hope, the hope of Israel that he is wearing this chain, the hope of the Messiah that has come and is because of his teaching of the Messiah that has him now bound over to the Roman authorities. The hope of Israel. What is the hope? That they would hear the gospel. That their hearts would be broken. That they would repent and that they would believe and they would be changed. And it is for the hope of Israel now that he is wearing this chain. The Jewish leader's response here in verses 21 and verses 22, it says, None of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you, but we desire to hear from you what your views are for with regard to this sect. We know that everywhere it is spoken against. They have, the message has gone out that this is a, a sect. A sect. It's not something to be Except it is to be considered a cult. The division between the Jews and the Christian is intense. So intense that Emperor Claudius had actually banned all the Jews from the city of Rome. So if anything, the Jewish leaders here are simply trying to downplay the dissension and try to keep the anger to a minimum. But they don't hesitate 
to throw a punch here when they refer to the way, the way being the followers of Jesus as a sect. They did it in previous trials in front of Felix and Festus and Agrippa. They want this to end, but they want to hear. They're intrigued to knowing. And in verse 23, they set up a time here. Verse 23 to verses 30. Let's look and see what happens. When they appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. And here we see the first house church meeting. From morning to evening, he expounded to them. Notice this. He expounded to them, testifying of the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they hear, but their eyes have closed. Or they, their ears they have can barely hear and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there for two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Think of this for a moment. When we study Isaiah and when we hear this passage how often do we wonder the context of this passage with their ears, they'll, they'll hear. Their eyes, they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. And we, and we picture in our, high, uh, in, our, in our minds and our hearts that this must be a picture of an evil, unloving God. But then we come to Acts chapter 28. And that's not the context. Isaiah is warning the people, the nation of Israel of this very moment when they hear the message of of the gospel, when they hear the message of the Messiah and they reject the gospel. They turn and they reject it. Is this not a warning for the church? Is this not a warning for every person to hear the message of the gospel and respond? To not become numb to the message of the gospel. To not become numb to hearing the word. Matthew 7, Jesus says, to those who, who say, did we not do all these things in your name? Did we not perform miracles? Did we not proclaim all these things in your name? And he says, I have never knew you. Is it not the same message of Isaiah? What keeps us from responding to the gospel? Is it because we grew up in a tradition of the church? Is it because we grew up in a tradition of our families going to church? Is it because we grew up in a place where we heard the message of the Bible over and over and over again? So much so that you can probably quote more of the scripture than I can. And so we think we know enough of it or we become hardened to it or we allow our minds to control how we read. And so we read it, but we're never penetrated by it. And so when we read it, we say, oh, it's just something else. It's just a moralistic way of looking at life. And we do not allow the scripture to to penetrate who we are. But here, Paul is standing before the Jews. The Jews are the reason that he got sent to Rome, had to, to beg to go to Rome because he was fighting for his life. And here, Paul is saying he's fighting for what matters. He is not afraid to lay it all on the line. And when he's chained to a Roman guard, nonetheless, he's standing before all these people, chained to a Roman guard who's hearing the gospel over and over again. 
He's chained there testifying to the kingdom of God, trying to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses, from the prophets. No, that's important. He's not using some smoke and mirrors. He's teaching them from what they know. From what they know. Because what the law and the prophets of Moses point to who? They point to Jesus. They point to Jesus. When we start Exodus next week, what does Exodus point us to? Exodus 1 points us to Jesus. When we get in Exodus 1 next week, Exodus 1, the whole thing points us to one place. It points us to a deliverance. I can't get there because i got to have something to say next week. But it points us to deliverance that is Jesus. And the whole point is, is we are delivered through one thing and one thing alone. And it is the king who has come and who has lived and given his life so that we may live. So when Paul gives them the law of Moses and of the prophets, he gives them the answer to the problem of pain in this world. And through the reason that we are lost, the same problem that we found last fall when we were right here in this place, this time last year, looking at Genesis 3. And he says, I will provide you a deliverer. I will provide you one that will crush the head of Satan. Albeit, it's strange. Crush the head of the snake that we just saw in Acts chapter 27. Crush that symbol. And it will be who? It will be Jesus. And some of us have been in church for 70 years and we, we put it in our heads and it never hits our hearts because we just, we do it by rote instead of doing it by letting the Spirit penetrate us and we become so consumed by church-isms or by doing church or by creating churches or by building churches or by making churches happen and we don't let the Spirit transform who we are or we don't allow it to happen. Notice Paul here. Paul had an interaction with Jesus in Acts and he never got over it. Paul is not a wacko. He's not a radical. He's not any different than who we should be. Paul had a life-changing encounter with Jesus, and he just didn't get over it. And the reality is, if we, if you and I have encountered Jesus, it should be the same thing. He met Jesus, and it changed his life. What happens when we meet Jesus? It should change us. And we don't get over that. We don't get over it. Paul is not a supernatural being. He just wrote a third of the New Testament, I know, or two-thirds. But it doesn't make him a supernatural person. Jesus did that. When Paul is crying out to Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verses 27, at the risk of being killed on the spot, he's not a supernatural person. He's just a person who met Jesus and didn't get over it. He didn't get over it. Romans 1, verses 16. Again, this is the context. This is the context for the book of Romans. Romans 1, 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. Why to the Jew first? Because it's the prophets who said it was going to go. It's Isaiah who says it's going to go to the Jews first. And then when they close their ears and close their eyes and ignore, then it's going to go to the Gentiles. They have their chance. And they still have their chance. But then it comes to us and by God's grace it works because we are here believing and repenting the journey is for us we have the right to believe. Paul was a man of great vision, knowing that his purpose was singular in presenting the gospel. Paul was a man who fought the fight at all costs, in all circumstances. And Paul was a man of great faith who understood that the gospel must continue to go forth and that God will, will fulfill his promises. For two years, Paul lived there in Rome, inviting guests to his home, presenting the gospel over and over again. And notice what he says. Notice what Paul says in Philippians 1 about his stay in Rome. Now, either this stay in Rome or the next stay in Rome. It was about his stay in Rome. In Philippians 1, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were beaten with stones to the point where you were left for dead, are you going to say that what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel? If you have 
have lost your job because you have shared the gospel with your boss and he says, well, I fundamentally disagree with you and you're not going to be employed here. Are your response going to be that what has happened to me has fundamentally served to advance the gospel? If you lose your friends and your relationships and your neighbors refuse to talk to you more, are you going to say what has happened to me has fundamentally served to advance the gospel? Is that going to be our response? Or is our response going to be, well, I'm going to have to try a different method and I don't think I can do this anymore. Paul's response is, what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all that the, the rest, that my imprisonment is for Christ. Bring it on. Paul says, keep rotating out these guards over here that are chained to me. Eventually, they're all going to know Jesus because I'm going to be here a while. Apparently, I'm not going anywhere. Let my brothers and sisters and my, my aunts and uncles and cousins keep persecuting me because it just means eventually every one of these people is going to know Jesus. What has happened to me has fundamentally served to advance the gospel. And he says at the end of Philippians chapter 4 verse 22, all the saints greet you. Notice the end of verse 22. If you don't write this down, if you don't want to turn there right now, the end of the book of Philippians, he says, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The Romans are believing more than the Jews are. Hello? When we deal with great suffering and great pain and all the rest that God chooses to place on our lives or allow to be placed in our lives, what is our response? Is our response, what has happened to me has fundamentally served to advance the gospel or woe is me because I don't like it. Can we all just be on one page here today? I don't like anything that's happened in the world, but it's not my problem. It's none of my business what's happening in the world. It's God's business. And he can choose whatever he wants. I'm just a prince. He's the king. It's kind of like you telling your child or your grandchild, get back out there. It's not over yet. When it's done, I'm going to call you home, but it's not done. Amen? That's the promise we have in Matthew 24. When the game's done, we're going home, but if we're still here, it's not done, so get back to work. That's the truth that we have in Acts chapter, in the whole book of Acts. As we conclude our series this morning, as we look forward to Exodus, I'm telling you, Exodus is going to be a fun series. If y'all thought Acts was fun, just wait. As we, as we look at this, we know that in suffering, in pain, as we look at the world and say, it's disgusting, God says, uh-huh. It's called sin. And it's not done until I say it's done. Expel the darkness, expel the sin, teach the gospel, love the people, make my name known. And what's the way we do that? We worship. We worship. We worship. We must not become distracted by tertiary issues that would distract us from the gospel. This book has reminded us that the church must stay focused on worship and worship alone. When there was the threat to the message of the gospel going forth in Acts chapter 15, a squabble over whether we place the law on the Gentiles, the church got together and say, we can't even carry the law, so lest we put it on somebody else, we stay focused on worship. We likewise must remember that we must not place barriers on the gospel going forward, either in messengers or in the recipients of the gospel. We should not build barriers in the church, on the church, or through the church, but we should seek unity and love. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, yes, 1 Corinthians 13, I know it's strange to hear that not in a, in a wedding, but 1 Corinthians 13 was not written for weddings. It's good for weddings, but it wasn't written for weddings. It was written for the church. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul writes, love never ends. 
Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Message church, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but, the, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. This is the message of the church. Let us be known as a people of love, not because we have to force it, not because it's unnatural, but because when we worship God, love happens. When we worship God, we reflect God. When we know God, we reflect God. God is a God of? God is a God of? So when we reflect God, we reflect so we know love. When we know love, we reflect love. It happens. So when we reflect love, we reflect the gospel. It's something that happens naturally. It's not something we have to conjure up or something that becomes unnatural, but it's something that happens naturally. We become a people of love. Paul, again, wrote 1 Corinthians, is writing out of a similar context we see here at the end of Acts 28. He's writing as a person who is chained to a soldier who has been betrayed by all of his family and friends, who has been left to his own demise, who is now saying to his people, be united in love. Be a people of love. Why? Because when you show love, the people around you will see love and they will know what? The gospel. Isn't that our goal? Isn't that what we're supposed to be about? We're supposed to be about showing people God, showing people the kingdom, showing people Jesus. And that's our hope. This is what we're supposed to be about. We're not supposed to be about creating systems. We're supposed to be about showing love. Showing hope to the nations. We're supposed to be going to the nations, going to our neighborhoods, going to the places that we're supposed to be. One of my great friends has always said this quote, and man, it slaps me in the face every time I say it and every time I heard it, hear it said by him. He says, there are no zero random people in our lives. Why? Because we are creatures of habit. Think about this. We actually talked about this on Wednesday night. Think about this. We go to the same grocery stores. We go to the same gas stations. We shop at the same places. We go to the same churches. Most of the time, unless you get mad at me today. Um, but that's beside the point. We go to the same places. We go to the same workplaces. You, you sit at the same places when you go to the same restaurants. There are zero random people in our lives. So when we say, well, I don't want to go just cold call somebody with the gospel. There aren't any cold call. You see the same people all the time. It's not hard. Most people, now this is a sociological study that my friend brought up, says that even when we go to the grocery store, we use the same checkout line. We're strange. All of us, not just me, all of us. There aren't any random people in our lives. So we see the same people week in and week out, day in and day out. We need to show love. We need to share the gospel. We need to be a people about the message of the kingdom. Not about the weather, not about the sports, not about anything else. Not about, we need to be a people about the kingdom. This is our commissioning. We are to go and we are to fight. We are to fight with love. We are to fight with the gospel and we are to lay it on the line to call each other to action. This is for everyone who calls himself a disciple of Christ. If we are part of the kingdom, we are commanded to suit up and to fight in his army. We see this in Acts. We see this in First Peter where we were this summer. This is our message. This is our commission. We are to go therefore make disciples of all nations, teaching all that he commands commanded us, and he is with us always, even to the end of the age. Acts 1.8, says, you receive power. Power. You're not going to be turned off. You're going to get power. This is our message. This is our hope. So that's, that's the challenge for the church. Y'all hold on to that nugget for just a second. If you're not a believer in this room this morning, or maybe you've been in church for 80 plus years, 90 years, or, or, or just the last 40 minutes and you're done with it, listen to me for just a second. If you've heard this message over and over again and you have failed to respond or you just are numb to the message of the word of God, you need to respond because we see the warning here of people who become numb and fail to respond. We don't get forever to respond. 
We see that in Acts. We see that in Isaiah. We see that in Matthew 7. We don't get for it. Respond to the gospel. Repent and believe. That is the message of Jesus. Repent and believe. See Jesus. Let it change your life. Have that response. Have that response. Meet Jesus and let it change your life forever. You don't have to become a freak like Paul because Paul wasn't a freak. He was a normal guy who met Jesus and never got over it. That's the hope we have, is that we will have people in this room who will meet Jesus and never get over it, and Grand Junction will never be the same because of it. Amen? Amen. That's our hope. Maybe you're in this room and you are a believer and you met Jesus at some point in your life. And pain and suffering and angst and whatever got in there. And we've talked about this for four weeks in a row and something is clouding your ability to worship. Lay that down this morning and repent. Because even idols that come because of suffering are idols that need to be repented of. Even idols that come because of suffering, pain, or whatever reason are idols that need to be repented of and repent this morning and remember your first love and worship. Before we take communion this morning, we all need to respond to the gospel somehow. We need to remember that we are to reflect love. We need to repent and accept the gospel for the first time or we need to come back and remember our first love. There are three options there this morning. We need to do one of those three. We need two. This table is about remembering Jesus, remembering that time when we met him and never got over it. And we need to experience that this morning. We need to remember him so vividly that when we leave here this morning, everybody's going to say, that's a bunch of wackadoos, and that's okay. Baptists have been known for being wackadoos for a long time. A long time. I have an executive from the State Baptist Convention here, and I'm saying this out loud, so I'm okay. It's okay. We need to remember him like we remembered him for the first time. That's what the Lord's Supper is about. That's what Jesus says. Do this in remembrance of me, not in somberness, but in celebration of the relationship that Paul is demonstrating, in celebration of the sin that he's calling out of, in celebration of the kingdom that we are working towards, in celebration of the moment in Matthew chapter 24 when he sounds that horn and says, It's done. It's done, and we're going home. So whatever we need to do in these next few minutes before we get to that point, let's do that so that we can truly celebrate and not look and be somber. Let's pray this morning.